All right, take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter number one. Matthew chapter number one on this Christmas morning, 2022. And uh, we're going to look here in Matthew chapter number one. And as you're turning there, I, I took in the Google search and I typed in the, the, T-H-E, Christmas story. And the first thing that popped up in there was a movie from 1983 entitled A Christmas Story. Now I want us to say there's a big difference between A Christmas Story and The Christmas Story. And uh, this morning we're not gonna be preaching about a movie, we're gonna preach about the Lord Jesus Christ and his precious birth. And uh, praise the Lord, we're gonna look at The Christmas Story right here. Now in our home, before we unwrap presents, uh, we pray, but we also, on Christmas morning, we'll read the Christmas story. And so we're a church family, so this morning we're gonna read the Christmas story out of Matthew chapter number one and Matthew chapter number two. If you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word. I'll start in Matthew chapter number one in verse number 18, and we'll read every other verse till the end of the chapter Matthew chapter number one, starting verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Wow! Now we continue on to chapter number two. I'll start in verse number one, and we're gonna read through verse number 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Wow, not a Christmas story, but the Christmas story. The title of the message this morning is We Can Learn a Lot from the Christmas Story. We can learn a lot from the Christmas story. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And Lord, I, I pray that you help us 
on Christmas. And, and wow, what a, a great amount of people here this morning. We're thankful for that. But help us to remember you, the real Christmas story. You being born of a virgin, you living a perfect life, and you as the Savior dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, we love you. We need you. Help us to open our hearts today. Lord, if there is somebody here that's never received you as their Savior, I pray that this would be the day of salvation. It would be a great day to get saved. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We can learn a lot from the Christmas story. And uh, boy, there's some truths right here I want you to see. Go back to Matthew chapter number one with me. And I want you to look at verse number, if you will, verse number 23. And before I get there, it says in verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. And in verse 23, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, it says, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You know, we can learn and be reminded that Jesus is God with us. Well, we can learn a lot from Christmas just thinking about Jesus and Jesus himself. Wow, Jesus was not just a man. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Wow. Let me just think about that. God with us. Luke chapter 2 says, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And we think about Jesus. He was born of a virgin, God with us. He, he lived a perfect life. He was the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He did suffer. He bled. He died on the cross for our sins. He was the New Testament fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifice. He was actually the Lamb of God, the final sacrifice for all of our sins, for once, as the Bible says, for all. Boy, that's good news. Yet three days later, he died on the cross, but three days later, up from the grave, he arose, proving he is God proving truly that he is God with us. And the story of Jesus, hopefully, him being the Savior, being God with us, never grows old. I was talking to somebody the other day, and uh, we just began a small chat, and then I began to mention that as a pastor of a church, and I remember uh, getting saved. And I, I, I told him about the day that changed my life forever. It was the day that I trusted Christ as my Savior. I realized I was a sinner, destined for hell, it wasn't my works that it could ever get me to heaven. It was only the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, that day changed my life when I called on the name of the Lord and was gloriously saved. Boy, that story of Jesus right here, Jesus is God with us this Christmas. And, and really for the rest of our lives, remember that Jesus is the Savior. He's God with us. Now, as we turn over to Matthew chapter two, wow. Wow. Here these wise men are coming from the east to Jerusalem. It says in verse one now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Often we'll sing that song, we three kings of Orient are bearing gift, we traverse so far. And we'll sing about three kings, but it says they're wise men. We don't know if there was three, we don't know if there was a hundred, but there was a group of wise men that came to Jerusalem from the east. And verse number two saying, where, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have, seen his, uh, we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. We are come to worship him. Now, th this is a great truth. You and I, we see this truth sometimes on, on bumper stickers or on a Christmas ornament or on a Christmas card. But wise men, these wise men from the East, they were seeking Jesus. And what we can remind it of the Christmas story that wise men still seek Jesus. Amen. And this is very important, right? Wise men still seek him. Boy, this world is filled with many things that uh, grab our attention. Riches, uh, glory, and honor. But you know, we as Christians should be wise and lead, be led to seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek him and you shall find. Seek and you shall find. Well, we ought to daily go to the Lord in Bible reason, seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to daily go to the Lord in prayer. Why? Seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be trying to be close to him, not a far away from him. In our lives, we ought to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Wise men still seek him. Just say that with me. 
Wise men still seek him. I think we got that. Now, go a little bit further, verse number four. Verse number four. And when he had gathered the, all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them. That's the demanding right there. He demanded them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. Now notice this term, Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is what? Written by the prophet? And then, then he takes that, that written of the prophet, the book of Micah. We would look at Micah chapter five, verse two, and he quotes from the word of God. He says, now, let me show you what the Bible says. And you're looking for Jesus. You're looking for Christ. You're looking for the Savior. We, we know the answer because the Bible gives us the answer. The Bible gives us direction. The Bible tells us exactly where he's gonna be born. Look at this. And it says, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, Art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. In other words, boy, they went to the Bible for the answer. Now, just follow along with me. Where, where, where's the Christ gonna be born? Well, we have the book right here, the book of Micah. Micah chapter five, verse two says in Bethlehem. And the Bible's true. It's true 2,000 years ago. Can I just tell you and be reminded of the Bible is still true today. The Bible is true till true today. Where is he going to be born? Well, let's just look what the Bible says. And can you imagine somebody over there and saying, uh, I, I think he's going to be born up in Dan, or I think he's going to be in Bethel. And somebody can say, what do you think about Bethel? You're, you know, he's going to be down, born in Egypt. And somebody else could say, well, I, I think this is the chief city, Jerusalem. He's going to be born right here. And you can look at that Bible believer and just shaking their head, no. No, no, we believe the Bible. Let's just look what the Bible says. It says Bethlehem. It means Bethlehem. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, now this is important. I met a man the other day. He was in a store, and uh, he began to look at my family. I was with my, my kids there, and uh, began some small talk. He was very talkative, uh, obviously a very smart person, and began to talk about his business that he owned. He's very successful very outgoing, and then I began to talk to him a little bit about me, I'm a pastor, and I, you know, I pastor Chesapeake Baptist Church, and he goes, well, I, I, I'm sort of Catholic, but he doesn't go to the Catholic Church. And uh, then he says, I, 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 I know a lot of things. I, and he kept saying, I know a lot of things. He said, many people think I ought to, I ought to be a preacher. And I, I began to tell him about how Jesus saved me. Jesus is the way to heaven, and I know that because of what the Bible says. And you ever talk to somebody where it went over their head? I said, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible has the answer. And he kept saying, I, 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 I think, I believe, I hope, I, I think. And he kept referring to I. Now there's two things right there. The Bible, the Bible, Amen. and everything else over here. And you have to choose what are you gonna believe. I think Bethel, I think Egypt, I think Jerusalem, well, the Bible says Bethlehem. And we, we have to just be simple Bible believers. You know, we're not Bible correctors, we're Bible believers. We're not Bible doubters, we're Bible believers. If the Bible says Bethlehem, God meant Bethlehem, he's gonna be born in Bethlehem. If, if the Bible says Jesus is the way to heaven, he's not a way, he's the way to heaven. And that's very, 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 very important right there. We're simple Bible believers. And wow, the Bible is true. I love uh, 2 Timothy chapter three. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's what you believe, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's interesting, you ever, you ever read the book of Judges? And it, when, I, when I talk about the book of Judges and you think about your knowledge of the book of Judges, you know, it was Pretty crazy. You remember Moses led the children of Israel. They got to the brink of the promised land. Joshua took them into the promised land and began to have uh, a wonderful, they conquered the, the promised land, dwelt in the, uh, the promised land. Right after that's the book of Judges, they no longer have a national leader like Joshua. And so in that book, there's seven cycles where all of a sudden they trust God. Then they begin to turn away from God and do their own thing. 
God sends a persecution, and next thing you know, they're under bondage. Then they cry out to God, Lord, help us. God spares them with a judge, like maybe a Samson, or uh, you think of a Gideon. Next thing you know, after they're spared, they go back into that cycle right there. But, it, but it's a cycle of chaotic living, you might see. say. The, you know what the very last verse of the book of Judges says? And, and, and it's a very important verse. The very last verse in the book of Judges says this. In those days... There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They didn't live over here in the word of God. Every man lived over here doing their own thing. You know, we can learn about this Christmas story right here. We can learn to live on this side. Hey, we can just believe the Bible. What the Bible says is true. The Bible's still true. The Bible's still true. The Bible's still true. Look back over Matthew chapter two and verse number nine. Wow. A lot of good truth right here in the Bible story. When, verse number nine, when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, what'd they do? Read it with me. They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And you can see them, they're, they're leaving Bethlehem, Bam, there's that star. And the star is hovering over where Jesus was and they're following that star. That star right there uh, was a, a representation. It was a reminder that this is where Jesus, that star was guiding them to Jesus. It's reminding them that Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, it's real, we're almost there. And they're getting there, they're like saying, wow, woo, praise the Lord, glory. And the Bible says they rejoiced with exceeding Great joy, not a little bit of joy, but exceeding great joy. And uh, they're like, whoa, hallelujah, my, praise the Lord. There's exceeding great joy. Now, here's the point. The Christmas story reminds us that Jesus still brings joy. And really, when I say joy, exceeding great joy. Uh, the word joy, it is, a, it is a feeling, it is emotion. Now, emotions can be bad, but that feeling or emotion, when you realize you get close to Jesus, you know everything's gonna be okay. When you get close to Jesus, there's a joy, there's a, a, a feeling, an emotion that, hey, everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's all right in my Father's house. He's in control, he has power. It may not look good, but everything's okay. Hallelujah, glory be to God. You know, Jesus still brings joy. The Christian, Christian walk is meant to be filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Whereas Christians, we're to have joy. It doesn't say we're always gonna be on the mountaintop, but, but in that valley, we can still have that joy unspeakable uh, because we're close to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice evermore. And it's important, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and long-suffering. I, <laughs> I watched this TV preacher the other day. And he got up, I, I'm gonna try to do it. I'm gonna try to do it. But he got up there and God loves you. And, and I can't even do it, but it looked like he'd swallowed a whole lemon. He was just upset. And maybe that's his joy, I don't know. But uh, he didn't look very happy about God loving you. And so, uh, but but we, we can have joy, me and my family, on uh, Wednesday night after the church service, I just looked at Mrs. Nettesheim and she looked at me and I said, let's get a hamburger. And so we went to a restaurant, we got a hamburger and we're, we're with the kids eating French fries and different things and we're looking at Christmas lights. And you know, we're driving through a neighborhood and there's Grinch, the Grinch and it's a big stuffed Grinch and I went, ugh. And then I saw a big Santa Claus and I went, ugh. And then I saw the gingerbread house. And it's a beautiful house, but ugh. And I said, kids, we need to find us a nativity scene. And I know there's a house that always has a nativity scene. And we drove over to the nativity scene, and it's not there. Ugh. I was disappointed. So I decided we're going to drive till we find us a nativity scene. Now, we, we kept driving. And sure enough, right down the street, there was a nativity scene. And there was this one that was beautiful. It was just a little nativity scene where they had a flashlight that went in and it displayed on the house a shadow of the manger scene. And, and you know, 
that, that scene right there, all of a sudden I didn't go, Ugh. I was reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ, him being born of a virgin and saving my soul from my sins, that I get to go to heaven, and it brought joy to me right there. And when we think of Jesus, we get close to Jesus, it brings joy. We sang that song this morning. Do you remember it? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven, heaven, nature sing. It's interesting, when we sing that song, that was written in 1719 by a man named Isaac Watts. And uh, he actually wrote it, if you would like to read it. I read it, uh, Psalm chapter 98. It was written from Psalm chapter 98. And really, it's not just about the first coming of the Savior. And uh, it's actually written about the second coming as Jesus being king. We sing it as the first coming, but no matter what, wow! Jesus, his first coming and his second coming, when you think of Jesus, it brings joy. You could go on and on. This could be a whole sermon about joy, but Job, uh, John chapter 15 says, abide in me. And then a few verses later, it says, these things have I written unto you. I wrote unto you, abide in me, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. Well, we ought to have fullness of joy. The Christian, I have fullness of joy. Boy, Jesus still brings joy, exceeding great joy. Now look back here, Matthew chapter number two. And man, so many lessons from the, the Christmas story. In verse number 11, and when they were come into the house, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. Fell down and worshiped him. When, when they got there, boy, they followed that star, they got there. You can think about the long journey, the trials, hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand miles. They finally get there, it's right there. They open the door, there's, there's the child Jesus. What do they do? They fall down, they worship him. When we think of that word worship, they fell down because they wanted to honor him, they wanted to respect him, they wanted to adore him, they wanted to give him glory, honor, and power. And we think about that, that falling down and worshiping him, he is worthy of our worship. He's God in the flesh. And those, those wise men, they just fell down. They said, he deserves this honor and glory. And they immediately worshiped him. This, this truth is found throughout the scriptures. An example of that would be Revelation chapter number four. And it says, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord. Now listen to those words. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And that's so important, right? Worship him, worship him. We ought to fall down in some ways and worship him in our hearts and minds. I took my little kids out the other day and I was going into a store and we're, we're going in there, my Amos, it's freezing. How many knew it was freezing out there? And my, somehow my Amos two and a half got in the vehicle without a coat. And so I get out there and I got this big coat right there. So I took my Amos and I put him right here and I wrapped him, I stretched my coat out like this. Now I have to stretch it because I'm a little pudgy right here, you know. And I, I got him in there and I'm carrying him in there and he's snuggling his head's like this. And as I'm doing that, there's this guy staring at me and he begins to wave at me and say, hey, I had no idea who he was. And then all of a sudden I said, oh, wow, I haven't seen you in years. And so he said, hey, get your kids out of the cold. I'll meet you inside. So I went inside there and there was a table on the entrance right there and I sat down. We talked probably for 45 minutes and, you know, boy, Christian. And uh, a long time ago, uh, we used to, to work together in the music ministry and there was a song, Brother Mike, you'll remember it, Worship the Lord. 
Worship, my mind came up and reminded that worship, we sang it like a thousand times. You ever heard of it? Worship the Lord. I can't, I'm not gonna sing it. I'll, I'll read the words. Sing to the Savior a song of praise. Come, let us worship the Lord. Trust in his might. Walk in his light. Come, let us worship. Worship the Lord. Great are his wonders and grand his ways. Come, let us worship the Lord. Heavens proclaim, Jesus shall reign. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let us worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Come, let us worship the Lord. Lift up your voice. Sing and rejoice. Come, let us worship Worship the Lord. Son of Jehovah, yet son of man. Conquering lion, yet suffering lamb. Worship, worship. Come, let us worship the Lord forever. Come, let us worship the Lord it really ought to be the theme of our lives. Now, now follow with me, because if, if you, you miss this, often we worship other things. We worship money. We worship our job. We worship our favorite football team. But, but here as Christians, we worship the one who's worthy to be worshiped. And Jesus is worthy to be worshiped. That's why we're in church on a Christmas morning. Why? We want to worship the Christ of Christmas. It's very, very important. Let's worship the Lord. Boy, in our lives, let's bow down before him. Go to him and say, glory to God. Hallowed be thy name. You're a great God, a, a conquering king. You're uh, the alpha, the mega, the first and the last. Lord, thank you for creation. Thank you, Lord, for giving me life. Thank you for giving me breath. Thank you for my family, my church family. You can go on and on. God is an amazing God. Go back here if you look at this last one right here. In verse number 11. Now, last doesn't mean I'm done yet. Because if I quit, like right now, it'd be like the shortest sermon or shortest service ever. And you know, well, if we go right here. Here we go. Verse number 11. And when they were come into the house, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, Frankincense and myrrh. Wow, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought their best to Jesus. And here it was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You can see that they carried that treasure all the way from that faraway land, and they got here, and they just, here, we want to give it to you, Lord. And I, I thought about that, gold, frank, I don't got much gold. I don't have any frankincense, and I don't have any myrrh. Uh, but you know what I do have? You know what I do have? Have you ever, you ever read Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. I'll read it to you, see if you get it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know, I don't have to bring Jesus any of my silver or gold, but you know what I can, I can do? I can bring him my body. I can give him my life. I can take what little life that I have. And, and life is but a vapor. Whether you're young or old right now, no matter how old you are, it's gonna be gone just like that. But whatever I have, I wanna offer him and present my body a living sacrifice. My will doesn't matter. God's will matters. My way doesn't matter, but God's way matters. What I desire doesn't matter. What God desires is what matters in my life. And I'd have presented all basically on the altar to him. Lord, whatever you want in my life. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do as the apostle Paul said after he first got saved? And what was he doing? He was giving the example of presenting his life. He was giving his best to the Lord. We should still bring our best to the Lord. We should give God our best. Boy, God wants you, not part of you, not half of you, not a quarter of you, not 90% of you. He wants you to be all in in your life. He wants not just the outward appearance, but he wants your mind, your heart for him. He wants you, to, it says, did you hear that? By the renewing of your mind, it was taking the old corrupt mind and throwing it in the toilet, you might say, and flushing it, and boy, and, have, and that's not a good illustration, but it's a good illustration. And boy, let, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, and have the mind of Christ. 
a, a mind that honors the Lord, thinks the Lord, not just outward. It should be outwardly, but also you ought to have a heart for God. Well, we ought to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. Well, present your, your body a living sacrifice. Give the Lord your life. Give the Lord your heart. Well, that's a good truth right there. It's a simple sermon. We sure can learn a lot from the Christmas story. First one, Jesus is God with us. He is the Savior. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, what a great day to get saved. It's easy. You're a sinner, destined for hell, but Jesus paid that price. It's not your works. It's Jesus. Simply say, Lord, save me, and he will. Boy, wise men still seek him. Boy, daily let us seek him. The Bible, still true. Quit saying I, I, I. Let's say, hey, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Jesus still brings joy. By the way, if you're lacking joy in your life, well, I really work close at getting close to Jesus and seeing him. Boy, Jesus is worthy of our worship, and we should still bring our best to Jesus and present our bodies a living sacrifice. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Good day. Boy, what a good church congregation. Boy, some families that are here, Lord, we're thankful for that. But in reality, this is our church family. And Lord, I, I pray as a church, we're filled with people that are living holy and acceptable lives to you. We're presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. I pray that you, we as a church and, and church filled with families, we still seek you. I pray that if there is somebody here that's not saved, I pray that even right now, they cry out to you, Lord, save me. I pray that you help us to find joy, and I pray that you help somebody that's struggling in that area just decide to get close to you, Lord. And Lord, I pray also that you'd help us to be a church filled with people that worship you, bow down to you. And Lord, I pray you bless this invitation that follows. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you